Isaiah 35. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For waters break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool and the thirsty ground springs of water. In the haunt of jackals where they lie down, the grass shall become reeds and rushes. And a highway shall be there, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. It shall belong to those who walk on the way. Even if they are fools, they shall not go astray. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast come up on it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return, and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. The second reading is from Luke 11, verses 14 to 28, and that can be found on page 1047. Luke eleven fourteen. Now Jesus was casting out a demon that was mute. When the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke, and the people marveled. But some of them said, He casts out demons by Beelzebul, the prince of demons. While others, to test him, kept seeking from him a sign from heaven. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a divided household falls. And if Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebul. And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they will be your judges." But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe. But when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest, and finding none, it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house swept and put in order. Then it goes and brings seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. As he said these things, a woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts at which you nursed. But he said, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. In our reading this morning, Jesus did something incredible. It is a, a miracle of speech. I wonder if, um, like the 10,000 in Trafalgar Square, if you are not enjoying communication through a, a face mask, just imagine losing the power of speech entirely. Um, it happens, sadly, my grandfather, after a, a stroke, was reduced to one word, the word no. 
though you can get a lot of service out of the word Nero. No, 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 you can do a lot with it. But um, between this man and the world was a face mask that he could not penetrate, could not be heard through, until Jesus arrived in his village on his way to Jerusalem and gives a command and the mute man spoke and the people marveled, it says in verse 14. The barrier is removed. It's a miracle of speech. And we are here for the reactions. Luke wants us to see over the next three weeks that something very strange is going on in the reactions to Jesus. And it it takes us straight into the world of fake news and QAnon and conspiracy theories. So here's our first heading. Point one, evidence and theories. Verses 14 to 16. See, the evidence is inescapable and unavoidable for those who knew the mute man. People lived then in extended communities. The the man would be well known. Um, You wonder how his life has been. Did he lose his job? What pressure did it put on his family? You you don't fake a, a total inability to speak, potentially for years. And you cannot fake the cure. Um, COVID rules or not, this man is going to the pub, isn't he? He's going to talk. Who knows how long it is since he's just spoken. Let me tell you what happened on the day that Jesus came through town. And can I say a word? Please don't be put off by the mention of a demon in verse 14 when it says, Now Jesus was casting out a demon that was mute, When the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke. Jesus and his contemporaries, they believed in an active and real spiritual world. It's not something that that Luke needed to argue for or apologize for. And you may not believe in anything beyond the, the material world that you can prod with your finger. But please don't take your assumptions and allow them to blind you to the evidence here. Luke, he is not unsophisticated. He is well-traveled, operating as something like an investigative journalist from Rome to Antioch to Jerusalem. And he is a medical man by trade, a doctor in a medical tradition better than anything that existed in these islands for nearly 2,000 years after Luke's own time. He shows consistent interest in eyewitness detail He tells us he followed the accounts of his sources closely and where we can check his accounts against archaeology and the wider historical records, he passes as a historian of high fidelity. We're going to have a a question time this morning. Please ask further questions in that area if you'd like to. So Luke does not assume ignorantly that all sickness is demonic. But nor do his assumptions rule that out. And on this occasion, he takes his cue from the victim, the witnesses, and from the one who provided the cure with a word. And if you disagree with the diagnosis, well, that does not dispose of the evidence. As if um, people who believe in demons might be confused about whether they were hearing Bob from the farm speak again after 10 years of silence. So the evidence is that there was a man who could not speak, and then Jesus commanded a demon to leave him, and from that point on, he speaks. There is Luke's evidence. And your assumptions, they may come lead-lined and unassailable, that there can be no demons in a world that also contains iPhones, but you still need to deal with the event itself. And Luke... He would like you to deal with his evidence more completely, more intelligently than the people he tells us about in verse 15 and 16. And they respond like the worst conspiracy theorist in the deepest rabbit hole on the internet. So Luke gives us two different responses to the evidence. Verse 15 I think in in terms of Donald Trump, verse 15 is a double down. So this comes from a committed ideological enemy of Jesus. So they see the man speaking who used not to be able to speak. 
and they know there is no way to discredit the evidence. So what must they do? They must discredit the source of the miracle. This is a PR strategy. This is a spin doctor's finest moment. This is a Twitter storm the week before the election. And in its own way, the fact that they even try this line, the one in verse 15, is some of the best evidence that the miracles were really happening. If if there had been any other way to discredit Jesus, do you not think they would have taken it? If it had been possible to to build a case that the mute man had never really been mute uh, or that he couldn't really speak now, um, they would have paid for those campaign ads. But the event is undeniable, so they double down. They say, well, yeah, sure. Sure, he can drive out demons. Of course he can, says the spin doctor, verse 15. He casts out demons by Beelzebul, the prince of demons. Um, Do you see the strategy? Accept the event, accept the power, there's no denying that, but make the crowd think that he is satanic. Satan has power. Maybe that's who Jesus is working for. Well, so verse 15 is a double down, and verse 16, that is what big tobacco and big oil have done so successfully, and it is what conspiracy theorists all over the world do, when presented with evidence that they do not like. Verse 16, while others, to test him, kept seeking from him a sign from heaven. And I think when you first read that, you think there must be a piece of the story missing because all around Jesus, there is a crowd marveling. And in the center of that crowd is a man they know well who is speaking for the first time in ages. And over that, they say, um, Jesus, I wonder, these, um, these claims you are making, could we not have a sign, please, from heaven, if you expect us to believe them? And it is particularly odd if you know your Old Testament, as they did. Because there is a fairly short list of official signs from heaven. And we heard one of those lists in our first reading that Claire read, Isaiah 35. If the blind see, and the deaf hear, and the lame leap, and the mute sing, then God has come to save you. And I don't think their problem is that the ex-mute man is refusing to sing, like us this morning. The evidence that cigarettes cause cancer, that evidence was there in the 1940s and 50s. Scientific experts employed by tobacco companies began saying that the evidence was overwhelming in secret internal reports that we can now read. But a smoker, I'm told, is worth $10,000 in profit across their lifetime. And so there was a sustained campaign along the lines of verse 16. Others, to test him, kept seeking from him a sign from heaven, literally blowing smoke at the evidence. Can we not have different evidence, more evidence, another piece of evidence, anything to prevent people engaging with the evidence we have and whether that is enough for certainty? And faced with these two reactions to the evidence, Jesus calls on us to react with greater intelligence and greater competence. And I've headed point two on the sheet, inappropriate indecision, which I think actually only captures part of it. So maybe cross that through and write instead point two, evidence suppression. Evidence suppression, and that's verses 17 to 22. Um, We don't yet have a vaccine for COVID-19, but there are 170 possible vaccines in research. 56 of them are in human trials and nine are in large-scale mass testing. $1.4 billion have been spent so far on research and countries around the world have pre-ordered millions of doses without actually knowing whether they work. It is the most accelerated high-pressure research program in human history. And at the moment... 
the phase we're in, you might call appropriate indecision. Just say that again because the word's important. Appropriate indecision. We don't yet know whether these vaccines work, and we don't yet know whether they are safe to use. Um, Oxford University has apparently done a deal with the EU, so it is possible, um, but has done a deal to sell its vaccine cheaply on the understanding that the EU will pay the compensation for any side effects. That's a good deal, isn't it? Um, appropriate indecision. Given the evidence we have now, it is not appropriate to start injecting people. And I'm glad to be doing this sermon now at this moment because I have zero medical training and zero scientific training and zero qualifications to be advising you about medicine. But there will come a point, we hope, when enough evidence is in. Um, that may not be to fit the November American election cycle. It may not get granny home for Christmas this year. But that point, we hope, will come. And I do have a little bit of training and qualification in how people behave. So here is a, a confident prediction from me. I predict that long after the point when the evidence is in, after it is sufficient and overwhelming even, there will still be a body of people who refuse to take the vaccine. Even though it will be obvious and necessary and important that everyone take it if we are to be safe, there will still be people who refuse and will treat the evidence in favour of the vaccine much as Luke's two groups treated the evidence for Jesus. I should point out that was an illustration, not a party political NHS broadcast. Um, some people will keep asking for more evidence long after that is wildly inappropriate indecision inappropriate indecision and others will um, burn around the internet with any number of increasingly hateful lies don't take the vaccine they want to control you they want to make you sick and uh, some of you I know some of you work in jobs where you are paid to take down fake news and here just this once um, Jesus steps into the chat room and he engages with the conspiracy theory. So look down at verse 17, where Jesus, knowing their thoughts, he said to them, and here's the answer. They call him Satan, and just this once, he takes the argument seriously and engages with it. Okay, let's suppose you are right, and Satan has given me the power to cast out demons and do the things that you have been witnessing for three years. Does that make any kind of sense? And verse 17, verse 18 says that that would be like asking half of your enemy to start killing the other half just to deceive the enemy. Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste. And if Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? Even if um, you succeed in the deception, your army is dead, your kingdom is ruined, and you are destroyed. And again, just notice, do you see how the weight of evidence is just assumed in the nature of this conversation? Jesus, he has not done one or two miracles, and only to the gullible, and only in far-off obscure places. There has been a three-year full-scale onslaught against all suffering and evil. This has been Isaiah 35 in spades. The blind see and the deaf hear and the lame leap and the mute sing from Galilee in the north to the crowded public squares of Jerusalem. And you need to be very, very dense to see that as something that Satan would be happy about. This is not a victory for the devil. The last three years, no, this is proof that God has come to save you. Or as Jesus puts it in verse 20, if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Blind, deaf, lame, mute. The, the four afflictions that can lock you away, 
lock you away from relationship and freedom and life. Remember, we're, we're reading about a world without Braille or carbon fiber wheelchairs or uh, social security. In that world, Jesus has exploded into the world like a, a, a bomb full of life. People are seeing and hearing and walking and speaking up and down the country. And your best guess is that Satan has been here. How prejudiced are you? Meaning that in, in its absolute literal sense, how totally have you prejudged the meaning of this evidence that you pretend to be testing? And uh, maybe I, I watched too much American TV over the weekend, but I can see verses 21 and 22 very vid- vividly. This is sort of intruder hostage rescue situation. So there is Satan. He is strong and armored. The, the kingdom of Judea has been his palace. And the people have been his own goods, his own safe possessions. But now, one stronger has arrived. Isn't that a vivid way for Jesus to explain his arrival? But doesn't it fit the evidence? Someone stronger and better armed has arrived in the palace, the true king, no less. And Jesus has attacked Satan and overcome him. And this is not some ongoing fight. It's not a rolling gun battle. Satan, he is face down on the carpet. The handcuffs are on, Jesus has taken away his armor in which he trusted, and Jesus is dividing the spoil. If it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And next to Jesus, standing next to Jesus as he speaks is a part of that spoil. There is a man unable to communicate with his family until five minutes ago, locked up in silence, a display in Satan's hideous trophy cabinet. And now he speaks. Jesus has looted him. Jesus parades him out before the the TV cameras like a kidnapped victim after the siege is over. He's safe, he's free. And Satan, all he can do is grumble in the police van. He can't do anything to stop it. In 33 AD, near the end of Jesus' march on Jerusalem, the time had passed for anyone to say that there was not enough evidence or for anyone to pretend that they are resisting Jesus' claims out of any kind of good intentions. No, now it is, our third heading, now it is time to pick a side. Verses 23 to 28. And what we have in the remainder of our verses is three different ways that Jesus says the, um, the same thing. I've chosen to, to take them all together. Verse 23 is the summary. Verses 24 to 26 is the warning. And verses 27 to 28 is the invitation. And they all say, pick a side. So Jesus, he is on the road to his capital city, on his way to deliver the killing blow to Satan on the cross. And he says, verse 23, and I'd like you please to look down at it carefully, uh, wherever you're listening to this and whether you've got a phone or a Bible physically in your hands, look down at verse 23, because it is the opposite way round to what Jesus says on other occasions in different circumstances. Verse 23, whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Whoever is not with me is against me. It is time to pick a side. Or actually, even stronger than that, isn't it? You have already picked a side. In these circumstances, asking for more evidence actually is choosing to be against Jesus. Now, isn't this the opposite of what we were told at school or um, what the sort of BBC Jesus would say? Um, I imagine this could be quite a shock to some listening this morning. If you have been told that Jesus is happy to embrace anyone 
who is not actively opposed to him, that we all get to heaven in the end and it, it doesn't matter whether you decided to follow him or not, whoever is not with me is against me. And more than that, even whoever is not actively on the gathering team for his kingdom, they are scattering. Now, um, please ask a question in the, the Q&A if you'd like to about the other times when Jesus says the opposite to this. It's when he is speaking to competitive disciples, jockeying for position, wanting to see who is best at gathering. Um, and he says to them, look, if you're on the team, you're on the team, relax. But here, with, with people calling him Satan and others asking for a sign, even though they have to shout literally over the top of the evidence because the mute man is still speaking, I guess, here on the way to Jerusalem to lay down his life with the, the doors open to a kingdom of freedom and life and forgiveness on the day when Satan is tied up and disarmed and any of his slaves can walk freely into the kingdom of Jesus from this day forward, whoever is not with me is against me. And by implication is enlisted in the long retreat of Satan on Satan's side. Um, again, please do ask in the, the Q&A. I need to say I think that this doesn't rule out a period of appropriate indecision in the life story of someone today. Again, let me say that again. I don't think this rules out um, you taking a period of appropriate good indecision in your life story at the moment. Um, you may be listening and, and you may never have heard that there was any evidence for Jesus whatsoever, let alone overwhelming evidence on a national scale that left behind debates like this in the historical records. Um, so you may need a period of time to test and weigh what is here. And actually that is very close to Luke's main purpose in, in writing, printed up at the top of the handouts. Luke's introduction explains his book as an ordered collection of eyewitness material so that people could have certainty about Jesus. So please do the research properly and at the pace that you need, but don't have any illusions about the end point of that journey. There, there will be a decision to be made, a choice. Will you be with Jesus or against him? There is no possible middle ground once you understand that he sees himself as the king of a kingdom and as a hostage rescue in a world that Satan has infected. Will you be with Jesus or against him? And I said 24 to 26 is the, the warning I'm not sure that's how people always read it. Um, this is not um, material from the Exorcist's handy handbook of demonology. This is not demons for dummies. This is a comment on what Jesus is doing and on what will happen after they have rejected him. So again, with the, the mute, previously mute man standing next to him, Jesus, he has made an obvious, visible, undeniable improvement in the life of this mute man and in, in countless of others up and down the nation. Any amount of evil and suffering has been driven away, like evicting a destructive burglar from a house. And Jesus, after the, the burglar has been kicked out, he has done the equivalent of sweeping and putting in order, verse 25, so that um, Israel by 33 AD is in a far better state than when he began his public ministry three years before. But he's saying here, you cannot bank his good work without joining his kingdom and expecting to go on enjoying the benefits. See, Jesus' story in verses 24 to 26, it is of an empty house, cleaned up and desirable, but with no one inside to defend it. And his um, unclean spirit burglar comes back after the police tape has gone and he finds it no harder to break in this time than the first time. And he sees the improvements Jesus has made and it encourages him to go and get seven mates, more evil than itself. And they all move in together. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. It's a, a warning to the mute man 
to do more than just speak. Um, he needs to speak to Jesus. He needs to turn to Jesus and join his kingdom. It's not enough to be grateful for the help. He needs to ask Jesus into the house of his life as defender and occupier and Lord. But more strongly, it is a warning to the leaders of Israel in Jesus' day and possibly to us if we find ourselves in the same attitude as them. They were happy to benefit from the work of Jesus, even as they did everything they could to prevent people entering his kingdom. He says, be careful. If you get what you wish for and manage to reject me and remove me, do not expect to keep the benefits that I brought you. Pick a side, lest your last state is worse than the suffering-filled slavery to Satan that Jesus has been reversing. And if all of that is too harsh for you, well then verse 27 and 28 is the invitation. I said a few weeks ago that I hear this strongly in an Irish accent. So verse 27, um, as he said these things, a woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, I'm not sure I'm going to try my ancestral accent. I've just caught the eye of someone in the room who is Irish. But um, uh, she says, blessed be the womb that bore ye." No, that's no good. Um, and the breasts at which ye nursed. Um, Here is a first century woman who has channeled 19th century Irish piety very strongly. Um, It is strong on Mary, it's matriarchal, and there is just a lot of biology going on in the verse. Um, But more importantly, this woman, she is pro-Jesus, isn't she? Glad that Jesus was born, glad to have lived near him, willing to give credit to his mother with blessings. And Jesus says that even that is the wrong response to him and the evidence. The the word rather in verse 28 is very important here. Um, Never mind whether Mary, mother of Jesus, is blessed or not. There is a way to be more blessed than her, to be blessed rather than her. And it is the same invitation we had at the beginning of the series in 10, 38 to 42. It explains what Jesus means by those who are with him. It is how to enter his kingdom and be secure and free from Satan and sin and eternal death itself. Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. And keep is a beautifully chosen word to express the Christian life. Um, Hearing alone does no good. That the people denying the evidence here, they have heard at one level, but it has left them outside and against Jesus. Keep. It is saying far more than just obey, though it does include that concept. The word literally is guard. Lock up inside you, behind strong gates, the word of Jesus. Keep watch over it. Don't let it escape from your heart. Live by it as the most important thing you own. And then, blessing. That is the blessed person. Everything that we've been speaking about for the last three weeks, the the simplicity and the wonder of being a disciple of Jesus, to hear directly from the Lord of life, to speak to the Almighty Father, to be given the Holy Spirit who brings us forgiveness and help. All of those promises underwritten by the overwhelming evidence that Jesus presented to his contemporaries. If you want those things, pick a side. Pick his side. Be with him and for him. And it ought not to be difficult. Step away from your chains into the blessings and the freedoms of the kingdom of Jesus. Well, let me lead us in prayer. Then I think we're going to have a short break. Is that right? Before the questions come and it will say on the screen how you can send in questions for us. So let me lead us in prayer. Our Father, we thank you for the goodness of Jesus, for the blessings he came to bring for his kingdom full of life and freedom and forgiveness. And we ask our Father that you would give us the ability to respond to his invitation in hearing and in faith 
and in keeping his words. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Well, now we've got some excellent questions arrived already. There's one long, more of a statement about, um, about vaccinations, the development of... Uh, of uh, uh, Not a scientist. Yeah, yeah, and so forth. And it's asking you to clarify that your illustration was merely an illustration. And the answer is, it was. Yeah, not a scientist. Thank you. Not a doctor. Um, Char- <laughs> Thank you for that great warning. I'm not going to read the whole thing out. Charlie spoke about how he doesn't rule out an appropriate period of indecision as evidence is gathered. How would this leave those who could be considered to never hear sufficient evidence? Are they inappropriate indecision? Uh, yeah, I think you can, you can sit too long. Um, that's exactly what um, verse 15, 16 is warning us of, I think. Um, you, and friends of mine have sat saying exactly this. It, you know, if God would just show himself to me, um, if only there was more evidence. Um, and I think in particular, you can sit there pretending to look for evidence when really you decided long ago that you did not want to be a Christian. And again, um, I've had the experience with a number of friends who have been honest enough to say, look, I do see that it is true, but I, I don't want it. Um, and, and it's very easy. It's a much more acceptable social thing to say, I think. I'm not convinced this is true. But actually, the Bible's really clear that a lot of this is about our hearts and what we want to be true. Um, and, and I think um, there's a tragedy there. Um, I sometimes use the illustration of, you know, the, 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 the marriage that people, the Bible uses the marriage relationship as an illustration of what God wants for us. Um, and, and in almost every rom-com that you'd ever watch, there is this period where they're too embarrassed or too uncertain or too something to, to ask, and it, they nearly miss out on the, you know, the future life and the, how wonderful it could be. Um, don't make that mistake with Jesus. If you think it's true, believe him, follow him. Thank you, thank you. Um, do we still have demons today? Should I be scared? Um, I think yes. So 1 Peter talks about Satan being um, like a, a roaring lion, prowling, looking for those who he might devour. Um, and um, and the, the, the warning is to be alert, not to be scared, actually, to be alert. So Satan works through temptation and through the world, the flesh, and the devil, and um, is as active even in his death throes today as, as he ever was. But um, I think the, the New Testament period, so Jesus' life in particular, was a unique period in history. Um, when Jesus enters into the world, God enters in person, and again and again and again in the Gospels, we're told that the demons knew him, and they, they ran to him to say, what are you doing with us? Why are you here? Um, they, they react to him as if it was the end of the world, um, quite literally and theologically speaking. Um, and I don't think we live in that period of time today. And so um, I think we should not expect the frequency with which Jesus encounters demons in his life. Mm. I loved your illustration of an explosion mm. of light and liberation. I mean, that does still go on, doesn't it, in individual mm. ways in people's lives? If God answers prayer, ask, and you will receive, yes. was last week's passage. Yes. Um, but I, I don't think, I, well, I certainly don't think we should leap to demons as an explanation of things that scare us or that we don't understand. Mm, thank you. And you just mentioned last week's passions. There are a couple mm. of questions here about how this ties in. We've had a talk on sitting at the feet of Jesus and listening, <laughs> on prayer, the Lord's Prayer, answering the Lord answering prayer. How do you think this section then fits? Mm. Thank you. Um, that's a very kind question because um, the, the top of the handout tells you that there was meant to be five minutes on that that got left on the cutting room floor. So um, I think in two ways. One is, here is the evidence that you can take the promises that Jesus has been making seriously. Um, and that I, I tried to nudge at that during the sermon. But the other that we'll come back to next week is this. Um, we've had three weeks on being a disciple. And we've said that it is particularly being a disciple when life is difficult and fearful and anxiety-making. That's what we've been saying for three weeks. And what we now have for three weeks is the, the reason why um, it might be difficult to be a disciple 
uh, where Jesus is uh, speaking. And um, some of the verses you've got at the top there um, bring us into a world of conflict. So beware of the Pharisees. And then later on, do not fear those who kill the body. And after that, can have nothing more that they can do. So actually, um, the disciples Jesus is speaking to are not inventing fears. They are in a deeply hostile world where people want to reject Jesus and then reject them. And we're, um, for three weeks, going to lay out why the world is like that and why mm. people do that. I mean, Luke has organized the material with incredible care. So you get discipleship and then hostility, mm. discipleship, hostility, discipleship, doesn't, doesn't yeah. he? Is that, is that right? Yeah, and chapter 12 in particular tells us how to live as fearful disciples yeah, or that, less fearful. Yeah. That, that's very helpful. A, a question about um, how a passage like this helps a Christian person as they interact with somebody who's investigating and perhaps is more skeptical? Hmm. Um, I, I hope it helps enormously. Um, I hope it gets us onto the front foot. Um, so did you hear, in, in Jesus' time, when Jesus is having a conversation with his most hostile enemies, um, there, there is not a slither of doubt that Jesus is overwhelmingly powerful. They say he's Satan. He can draw on this evidence that he's been doing these incredible things up and down the country, and he can get right onto the... Sorry, that's a sporting analogy, is it? A sport I don't even play. He can be, you know, pushy um, and say, you are idiots. Um, Jesus is quite comfortable doing that because the evidence in his day is so good. Now, we um, were not personally there, we don't have first-hand access to that evidence, but um, it is written into the historical records, and even the reasons why they killed Jesus, and therefore into the politics uh, and archaeology of the time, this world in which Jesus exploded with everything that he did mm. and the way that people responded to it. And I think um, particularly we can push people on their assumptions um, particularly if, they, if they, you know, they see the word demon and, and say, oh, there you go, I knew this was fairy stories. Because the, the, the event we're talking about it is not a fairy story event. You had a man who was unable to communicate who then, after meeting Jesus, speaks. And the, the central event, obviously, that we're talking about is a, uh, an executed corpse uh, that was tested, proved to be dead uh, by a third-party government was stuck without medical help in a tomb for three days, and then rose, walked around, ate fish, barbecued, and persuaded his disciples that he was God and the Lord of life. Um, you may want to think hard about that in the time of appropriate indecision, but you can't just say there's a fairy story. Their best friend died, and they saw it happen, and then he cooked them a meal three days later. Um, they're not confused. They might be lying, but there's, there's no cause for this sort of arrogance. Oh, oh, simple people believe things mm. like that. Mm -hmm. And the mere way in which he's written the material shows they're not simple people. Yeah. <laughs> really helpful, your comments about Luke and his kind of medical background and so forth. I mean, this is, I, I'm intrigued just to hear you speaking like that, Charlie. I mean, do you think if Jesus, I know this is a ridiculous question, but hypothetically, were he to come today we would actually find people forced to the same kind of conclusion. Oh, well, we can't deny it. There must be an evil power at work. Yeah, I, absolutely. I think, it's, and it's clear through Jesus' life that, yes, there's a sort of initial period of, wow, he's amazing and isn't this exciting, but they are forced to two places only. Either you are with me or you're against me. And it, it's clear from early, early in his life that those who won't accept him must kill him. And, and I think that I've seen that in people's lives today, um, that if, if you will not have him as Lord and you won't accept his rescue, then you must get him out of your life. This, this whole um, idea that we can sort of be with Jesus and for him without submitting to him is based on a completely fictional Jesus with all of the offense uh, and integrity in him taken out. Mm. The real Jesus, you either love him or want to kill him in the end. So question here, you use the house as a picture for Israel and also for the individual mute man. Is it also representative of individual people today? I think you've just answered that. 
Yeah, I think so. And I, th yeah. I think we are a culture that has benefited second and third hand mm. from the sweeping work of Jesus. Um, the, you know, uh, there's, there's nothing particularly um, ordered or good about these islands. And before Christianity arrived, they were as full of murderous superstition and horrendous things as anywhere else. And we have benefited over a period of time from being swept and put in order. Um, and, and if you try and have the benefits of Jesus or offer people the benefits of Jesus without Jesus himself, well, Jesus warns actually that that leaves you worse off <laughs> in the end. What do you think that's got to say to the kind of social conservatives, the kind of Douglas Murrays of this world who want Tom Holland, you know, yeah. the, the benefits of Jesus without Jesus or the kind of liberal progressive equivalents on the other mm. side. What, what do you think that's got to say there? Do you mean liberal Christian sort of equivalents? No, Don't just, just liberal progressives who want the kind, many of the benefits. Yeah. Well, so it, the, the good thing about um, Douglas Murray, t Tom Holland, is, is that they are pointing out that we have a vacuum at the moment in our culture. Um, one person who I've been reading through Luke with, um, his comment on this passage was, nature abhors a vacuum. Mm. Um, actually, you, you cannot have the, the trappings of Christianity, the frameworks, love your neighbor, um, do good, uh, care for the weak uh, rather than the strong. You cannot have that with a big empty space in the middle where Jesus should be. Um, it will collapse eventually. And you can see them talking about, we, you know, obviously we don't want Jesus, but we don't really know what to put in there anymore. <laughs> oh, help. Um, whereas I think the, the secular liberal progressive is at least a bit more honest. Um, in that they, they, they think they have torn down the house um, and they're heading off somewhere else um, and hoping they can rebuild it. And it, it's increasingly obvious, I think, that what they're building doesn't have the ordered swept uh, protection for the weak, um, protection for freedom of speech, protection for tolerance that, that they think they want. Um, and, yeah, we'll see where we go. Yeah, really good. Thank you. We've got to begin to draw very now quickly to, to a conclusion. If Satan doesn't cast out Satan, how did false prophets elsewhere in the New Testament mm. then cast out demons? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, and I think, yes, so G Jesus at one point says um, in the end of the Sermon on the Mount, isn't it, the, this group who will say to him, Lord, Lord, and he will say, I never knew you. And among the things, let me see if I can find it, um, the things they did, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Um, I, that is why I tried to frame Jesus' answer in terms of his entire life's work. Um, so uh, that, that Jesus has not um, successfully improved the life of one individual somewhere. Um, this has not been a contract or a sort of emotional hype, or he has dealt with every sickness and every, um, including death, um, in every location that he goes to. They bring him everybody and he cures them all and drives out every demon. So this is, this is an entire body of work that is the destruction of Satan's hold. No way that could be a deceit. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you very much. Last question then. I'm sorry, we haven't quite managed. We've done most of them, but just... Uh, last one. Does this mean that those who have constantly asked for more evidence have taken Satan's side? And how should that impact, you know, the way we view them, perhaps pray for people, interact, and so forth? I, I think in, in the vocabulary of the passage today, it does. But I, I don't think we should get, you know, over... Hor so that the Bible, when it talks about someone who is not a believer in Jesus, um, as, you know, we we all were, unless you had the privilege of growing up always knowing and trusting Jesus, talks about us as dead, um, as slaves to sin, as um, deserving of God's anger, and, um, and yeah, as, as following the, the, the spirit of the air, which is Satan. Um, it's not saying that your friend is knowingly, you know, there, there is no altar with a goat on it somewhere in their bedroom concealed behind a secret panel. Um, it's just saying that, that there are two kingdoms mm, mm. and two lords. And um, unless you move into Jesus' kingdom, you remain where you are. Um, and I think it means we pray, but we, we, don't, we pray with confidence um, because this is the God who can reveal 
uh, light out of darkness, shine light out of darkness, and can reveal his truth into anybody. Um, and Luke, um, the person he knew very well and followed around was Saul, uh, the, the great persecutor of Christians who traveled from town to town breathing out threats so that he could kill them and in an instant is turned into the, the greatest preacher of the gospel in the world. Um, and Luke knew him well and traveled with him. So there's no sense of despair. It's pray and trust God. Well, Charlie, we're going to, don't go away, we're going to uh, draw to a conclusion. I'm going to ask you to lead us in prayer. So we ask that we would be strengthened with all power according to God's glorious might, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light and has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Amen.